Howdy to ya. Howdy to ya. Howdy to ya. Apple computers designed, designed in California, California, assembled in China, and all the other folk that'll have a listen to and a look see here to this YouTube video we're making. Now, this video you're seeing is highly edited, and I guarantee you that the original material is well documented in my personal data bank of this here problem that we got. My name is Nick Breeze, and under that handle, I make new media art, I organize new media art events, and I produce digital projects for different clients. I also work as a professor in a fine arts college here in Chicago, Illinois, and what we do there is stay on top of culture, digital culture, and experimental new media art. And we discuss, analyze, and we produce experimental new media art, and we're pretty good at doing that. And that's sort of the point of this here YouTube video is that I realize there are other factors in the society that ain't so good at doing their part in this digital ecology. I'm also known as a customer of Apple Computers, having recently bought a MacBook from you a couple of months ago. Thanks for calling Apple Care. This call may be recorded. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nick Breeze, and I should inform you at this point that I am recording this conversation so that uh, you understand that. Okay. Okay, now, okay. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm a dissatisfied customer, and I develop, uh, I'm, a, I'm a new media artist, and I develop uh, artware applications, and uh, I recently upgraded, or I didn't upgrade, but the new MacBook Air comes with the most recent operating system, and when I try to launch any of my um, artware applications, I'm given a, a warning that says something along the lines of the, of the, of the app not being approved by, by Apple, and there's, there's no way to cancel out of that, and then I realized anybody else running the same operating system um, with, with Gatekeeper, like you mentioned, they won't be able to launch my application unless they've also changed that settings. And, and most people that I've spoken to didn't, don't realize that that's an issue. They just, they just think there's something wrong with the, with the artware. Okay. Now I have a question. Now do you, um, do you develop in the, um, in the App Store, or is it just on your... On you, are you just freelancing, freelance yeah. development? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The only way the, the bypass is not a way unless you're going through the Apple Store to just overwrite that sort of setting. If I go through the Apple Store, then they wouldn't get that that error. That's correct. Okay. Is there? I mean, I've heard some other local artists that uh, distribute for uh, that I know that do stuff on on iPhones and iPads. And they've mentioned they've had some issues with. Um, intellectual property before. Box Party ex exists to uh, create digital tools for our digital lifestyles that reflect our lifestyles. You know, we, we saw a lot of opportunities as, 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 as we were looking at this whole thing develop. You know, we, we saw the App Store. Satramizer for iPhone was the world's first multi-touch glitch application. Uh, the first listing of artware on the App Store. Um, you know, we've been in this long enough to know that we have good ideas and uh, there's a lot of room for growth. What's the status of SOS now? Mm. Like, how accessible is it? What would one? What does one have to do to get? Well, like, to 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 use SOS uh, currently, our user base is I think it's under ten, mm. um, under five, under yeah. I think now it's it's gone down even further mm. um, because you can't run it on any of the newer Apple devices, which I think speaks to uh, the sort of culture of obsolescence. You want to update, you want to upgrade, and developers start building in new things, and you need to update to take advantage of the new versions of the software. We don't take advantage of operating system features from iOS. We have SOS, which has its own features, and they're just fine, mm -hmm. and we've never felt the need to, to yeah. upgrade those features in the past three years. The only reasons that we would need to update, and the only reasons that we're uh, in the in the position of updating things is because doors that have been shut in our face by Apple by their kind of no holds bar throw everything old off the truck right yeah you know uh, we're scrambling at the at the edge of the truck trying to catch stuff and and maybe grab onto the truck at for one point just because the truck moves faster I mean there's all kinds of good stuff falling off the truck
I think my major my major beef with Apple is their proactive decisions to intentionally cut support for features um, on a regular basis in order to sort of force the users into the new system and the new way of doing things. But I feel like you know like they, they they never really explain to you what you're doing when you're updating unless it's like a major update that you read about on like Gizmodo. Um, for this one project that I was doing called Okay, I'm going outside. There was um, a bunch of uh, codecs, I think that were like Cinepak codecs with like 256 colors or 256 grays. That was getting a really nice look that I liked. But then during like a small update, you know, so it was like 7.4 to 7.5, they eliminated a whole bunch of what I guess they felt were like out of date and useless uh, codecs for ways to re-export with QuickTime Pro. So. Basically, I lost a way of creating footage that was important to that project, so it kind of like stifled it in the middle. In addition to just changing the way things are done so that you know new programs and new external hardware only works with the latest devices, they also don't maintain any sort of backwards compatibility. This sort of lack of backwards compatibility creates a lot of problems uh, across the board, but it's particularly a concern for small projects, a new media artists who maybe has created. Um, piece of software intended to be run on a certain version of Mac OS or on iOS or whatever. May not have the time to go back and every time there's a new Mac upgrade, debug the problems that have been introduced and upgrade it to the latest like version of the graphics rendering system, whatever else it may be. In contrast, if you develop something purely on, on Linux or on a Windows-based um, operating system, then you're guaranteed support for a much longer set of time. That means that you can write a little a little piece of hardware, a little piece of open source software that serves a useful or an artistic purpose, um, put it out there, and um, pretty much guarantee that somebody will still be able to run that um, on their system 20 years into the future. Um, this is something that you not only can't guarantee with Mac OS, but you pretty much guarantee is not going to happen. Um, How many years do you get with Mac? With Mac, you get you get three years. I, I'm not even sure if that's a three-year guarantee or not. It's guaranteed that someone would still be able to use the operating system that it was made for three years later, and the OS will still be supported. But there's no guarantee that even on the next uh, next upgrade that um, any sort of backwards compatibility would be supported. I mean, the way that I get around that so much is just not ever upgrading anything. Have you run into bugs for that reason? Like, or any, any kind of limits oh, yeah. or obstacles? Oh yeah, I mean, like, because my operating system is so old, it just slows down the functionality. How, how many years old is that? Do you That's know? like three years. Right. Which, in Apple years, like a century. <laughs> Back in the day, like, they used to build um, appliances and dishwashers and everything to last forever and then they figured out how to um, plan the plan the death of these um, and Apple definitely does that I mean they're just trying to keep people to keep you know keep buying keep thinking that what they have is is not up to snuff which most of the time it is Anytime I'm like when I'm frustrated using my Windows machine, it's usually because it sucks. Some, there's something they did that was like, whoops, that was a shitty thing. Like it, or like Internet Explorer, for example, is like one of the worst products in terms of web in, yeah. in the universe. Um, but then anytime I find myself really frustrated with a Mac, the issue that I'm that I'm frustrated with is usually there by design. Yeah. Oh well, I mean, like for example, with the what is the, the mini display port out? Like you can't go analog out from that ever. Which I mean, obviously, you know, it's like you you know makes sense because they want to be able to like protect their videos and protect the interests of the studios who you know are selling stuff on iTunes. Yeah. Anything wrong with a Mac is there because they there's something that's cool that you want to do that they don't want you to be able to do. Not just because like they couldn't do it. Like you get the impression that they're definitely like thinking about like oh how would somebody use an analog you know a, a composite out from a computer and they're like oh to record stuff which you know is maybe true but also maybe just like because they wanted to record something cool that they were doing with their laptop not necessarily that they want to be stealing stuff which you know yeah definitely makes it tougher as a new media artist. And then there was like a movie that I watched a week ago. I had purchased through iTunes, downloaded it. It's cool. I used my external display, Apple display by the way, and I get a little pop-up and it says, um, this display is no longer, it's like, does not comply with 
HDCP, blah, blah, blah. I don't understand why it wouldn't be compliant. Apple's iTunes has already been HDP, HDCP compliant for a long time because of licensing reasons with uh, major motion picture corporations. I just don't understand why it would work one day and then after an update it's not anymore. Is it really a hardware issue or is it a like out mode issue like we're not going to support this anymore kind of a thing? And I don't really know, but I want an answer. Now I don't think you quite understand the problem that we got. You see, I represent a community of folks in this here United States that is dirty deeply concerned with the digital Art, network culture of information and communication the system in these guys, United dirty States dirty of America in the bicentennial year 2013. And the problem Chicago is that some of us media. folks out here, we understand that it's a deep and dire predicament of men and women learning to live with machines, and that pulls into account a certain amount of attention that needs to be paid to our relationship to this digital ecology. Now we folks out here, we've got our tech together, we consume, and we produce, we can service, we can maintain. But the problem comes down to that my computer doesn't seem to be able to be serviced and maintained. Um, I'd like to be able to do an upgrade on my RAM, but I can't for the life of me get my, uh, my MacBook open because it would seem that the Philips screws have been replaced with some other kind of, some sort of proprietary screw. And I, I need to get this plate off, otherwise I, I can't upgrade my RAM. Yes, um, in order to get more RAM for a MacBook, you'll have to upgrade to a MacBook Pro, because the memory, it's an onboard memory, which means that it's soldered on. So, um, you won't be, it's not RAM they can just take out and put back in. So RAM, RAM is, upgrading the RAM is, is off the table. Um, but if, I, I guess I still have the issue of being able to, to service, service my, my computer. Um, so if, say for example, I have a battery issue, which, which has happened to me before, um, and I want to swap my batteries with a new one I purchased, how, how am I supposed to open, how am I supposed to open it up? Well, we don't, we, we don't sell batteries for the, for the MacBook Air of this model. If you need the battery service, then we uh, will have you go to a um, authorized service provider or an Apple store. Oh, okay. Well, that that comp that's a pretty complicated process to switch a battery. Still, that still doesn't actually address the issue of, of the proprietary SKUs and not being able to service my machine. I mean, sometimes, like generally every once in a while, I just try to do a general cleaning. You may have to and they have to take it to a service provider to see if they can do that because, you know, those proprietary tools, we, we don't give it to customers because we, um, we made the uh, MacBook Air a, um, a non-serviceable product for the customer. So, okay, that complicates it even more. So if I want to just spray some compressed air, you're saying I've got to, I've got to take it into the door so somebody can open it up? Yes. Oh yeah, no, hard drives are no longer user serviceable. Neither are batteries or RAM or um, anything. Anything at all. I can't put a new hard drive in my computer because it violates my user service agreement. Second of all, um, Apple now uses uh, proprietary hard drives that are not made to standard specifications. Laptop hard drives, like 3.5 inch hard drive sizes have been standard for a long time. And maybe that's time to change, but making it a non-serviceable item where if I need to replace it, I need to go to Apple and buy their version of something because they control what I put in my computer isn't the way to do it. I feel like, you know, like in a box like this, right, where you're just going to be seeing like, oh look, like there was that one time I was like borrowing somebody else's computer and I needed to get an output to VGA, so I had to buy this one, and then, you know, it's like, oh, for the mini display, I had to get this one, and then, oh, you know, like, you know, I feel like the amount of like proprietary stuff that I can use for nothing else, like, you know, this is for an iPad out, 
uh, the old one when you wanted to have the uh, analog out. But I mean, I kind of almost have like a like begrudging respect for Mac because it makes you buy so much. Like I mean, like they're great businessmen. Anytime you want to set up anything interesting <laughs> in a new media or a video context. You know, it's, it's going to be live for a Mac, it means that you're going to end up having to spend a bunch of money. Apple's community relations person contacted us and wants to do something tech related to showcase their products and the things artists can do with them. Brandon already mentioned Glitch and they are all about it. I THNX for writing. Much of what happens in glitch art is intentionally critical or openly oppositional to the corporate logics of companies such as Apple. Here is an example from a recent essay of mine written for this year's GLI.TC slash H Festival's publication. The corporate logic of our consumer computing devices relies on false promises of, or rather belies broken hopes for, functionality or rather is constructed proposed on the basis of lies which cover the coercive force in the form or fabric of functionality. Nick, what are your thoughts? We have been trying hard to get Apple in as a sponsor and I don't want to offend them. information storing and retrieval and stuff like that this is another breed of computer entirely called an analog computer and um, it's optimized what makes it different than most uh, general purpose analog computers is that this one is optimized for processing uh, video information for processing television information although it also can process sound or any other signal uh, within some restrictions There's a long history of this kind of practice here in Chicago. Some of our scholars, historian John Cates, traces these practices as far back as the late 60s and early 70s to folks such as Phil Morton and Dan Santeen, who in uh, 1971 wrote a manual called The Distribution Religion, which were instructions for how to faithfully reproduce the Sandine image processor, which was a analog video synthesis computer that they developed. Not too dissimilar to your first computer, which also shipped with schematics, the Apple I, uh, which you produced a few years later in 1976. See, we're not so different. Y'all with your homebrew computer club, we're also self-professed hackers. Waz and I uh, had known each other since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And we built, uh, our first project together was we built these little blue boxes to uh, make free telephone calls. Those Apple guys, they started making hacking tools. They, make, they made blue box tools mm -hmm. for hacking the phone mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. uh, we make hacking tools, mm -hmm. you know. We make tools that hack themselves. We make tools that are hacked by default. This almost sounds like, like you're in competition with Apple, but but you're, well, you're working in their, in their well, ecosystem. Well, listen up. I mean, we're, we're the underdogs here, mm. you know? We're independent developers that, that we're indep independent developers that are also artists that, you know, have started a small venture in a basement in Chicago. And, uh, you know, we're looking to grow. It sounds sort of similar to some of these other success stories, and I think we're headed there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Picasso had a saying, he said, Good artists copy, great artists steal. And we have, you know, always been shameless about stealing great ideas. Um, so here we realize that copying is how creativity works. Of course, you also realize that, having copied your biggest breakthrough, the mouse and the graphical user interface from Xerox who also copied their ideas from Doug Engelbart and Vannevar Bush, who copied their ideas from Charles Babbage or, and or whoever else. As Yokai Benkler and many others have explained, culture is both an input and an output of its own production. As far as culture and information are concerned, you can't get something from nothing. Furthermore, copying is how digital technology works. This video you're watching right now is itself a copy. 
In fact, it's what you might call a faithful reproduction. And that's all we're trying to do here, is copy as straight and honestly as possible. Copying is as good, I think better, from this vector view as any other way of getting there. Frankly, I, I think Pox Party started as kind of a conversation between uh, me and Ben with different projects. Then we uh, started trying to release stuff into an ecosystem and on tools that, that were controlled and, and slowly closing. When Ben added multi-touch to the Satramizer and uh, we released it for the iPhone, there were some issues with some of the iconography that were being that was being used, right? The... Yeah, we we used the spinning beach ball from the Mac when the app first launches, and then we submitted it and it got rejected. And well, we thought it was going to get rejected because it was corrupting data. Yeah, but they didn't seem to have a problem with that. They didn't like that people saw this thing that you know you associate with waiting. Mm -hmm. So they said there was some kind of trademark issue, and I said. Well, what do you mean? You know, we own all the trademarks for Satchermizer. Yeah. And they said, no, no, it's not about that. It's about, you know, the beach ball. Mm -hmm. So we, we had to remove it. Mm -hmm. We had to, mm -hmm. that's part of getting yourself into another eco ecosystem is it's about adapting mm -hmm. and, and could the constraints and they force you to do this thing mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily want to do, but mm -hmm. you have to do it because mm -hmm. if you want to play in their garden, mm -hmm. You have to jump over the walls. Yeah. And you have to wear their costume. And you have to dance their dances. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to drink their punch. Mm -hmm. And their punch tastes horrible. <laughs> so we, yeah, we changed the, the icon for loading and it went, went through like nothing. You know, it was, it, it was just literally just this issue of an icon that is associated with something that is... Um, Negative. Makes, make, yeah, negative, or makes you wait. Which I think, you know, really, like, the beach ball in itself is not a, it doesn't, like, when you see a rainbow beach ball, it doesn't make you think about waiting at all. Mm. I think, I think the impetus for using that icon is even to make you forget that you're waiting. You think so, you're on the beach. Yeah, so, so to use it to, to show that you're waiting, it confuses their narrative, or confuses their messaging. They don't want you to think about that. Yeah. They don't want you thinking about the beach on the phone. No. No, the beach doesn't exist. Don't take your electronics to the beach because no. you'll get sand in them. That's probably why. They're probably worried about water damage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in addition to the, the, the whole issue of like it being like an entirely closed system where they have to uh, you have to follow their guidelines and they have to approve things individually, blah blah blah. Um, I don't really like that, but I could even live with that if you didn't have to pay them to, for permission to develop software. For which ultimately is what adds value to their operating system. If they had devices with no apps, like nobody would buy them. The, the apps is what, what makes it. And in order to actually develop apps for iPhone and iPad devices, you have to uh, pay a $100 yearly fee um, for a developer's license, which, by the way, can be revoked at any time for any reason. Intention of building a company. Mm -hmm. But you were just out to do stuff for yourselves. Uh, when we started Apple, we were out to build computers for our friends. That was all. No idea of a company. We started a company because it was the only alternative left, not because we wanted to. Well, what we've realized is that we've been playing on the outside, not being approved, being rejected, uh, within the walled gardens that have already been set up. In order to actually put apps onto the App Store, we have to come up with a legitimate legal organization that is Pox Party. Mm -hmm. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let an artistic uh, collaboration uh, release apps in the App Store. It has to be uh, connected to an entity, right? And, and the entities that rule our world are corporations. We're meeting with a lawyer soon. And if that means we have to be incredibly non-creative, set up a corporation, go into some sort of partnership that we never intended to go into as mm, to... Just you know, to formalize it in that way, yeah, on it paper, just, it's like, you know, it's like a, it's like a civic yeah. partnership. For Apple, I mean, to play. We now to play ball. We play Apple ball. Yeah. Now Apple computers, you can see that uh, I've been having some problems with my relationship to digital tech. 
Now I'm quite serious that I'm interested in creating a happy ending to this here YouTube process we're doing. And I have a particular desire to creatively improve our relationship to this digital ecology. And I do believe that I've been keeping up my end of the deal, both as a consumer and a producer of digital culture. And I, I am just a people. And I, as a people, have been consuming and producing my thing. What we're facing now are some problems. The stuff that we've made is not working on the new devices. Because it gets obsolete, it gets ruled out. It's not a possibility anymore. You update to lose functionality. What? Who does that? I, as a people. <laughs> <laughs> that was so, you're so pissed. <laughs> I, as a people, am consuming and producing my thing. I, as a people, am producing and consuming my thing. We as a people, us as a, we as a, we as a, we as a company, we as a company, a company a, made of people. people. Com companies are people. We, we as a people company have been producing and consuming our thing. Our thing. Our, th our thing. Our thing. Our thing. Because the people that worked on it consider themselves, and I certainly consider them artists. These are the people that under, under different circumstances would be painters and poets, but because of that time that we live in, this new medium has appeared uh, in which to express oneself to one's fellow species. And that's a medium of computing, to express their, their feeling. Artists have specific ways that they use technologies and tools. There are so many loyal, you know, it is the art, what did you say before, the art? the default art computer, um, that should be more important to them. And if they want to keep those customers loyal, they shouldn't be making it so difficult for us to use their software. I think Apple is just, they're just concerned with um, general kind of consumer. It's weird that they have this kind of rep as like the creative computer because in a lot of ways it's almost like, I mean, it kind of is only if you're willing to kind of play within the rules that Mac sets, which seems like such a kind of uh, backwards way of promoting yourself as like the creative computer. I mean, with that said, like I, I use a Mac, so I don't know. I mean, but that's because school makes you buy a Mac, right? Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> With the rise of like Adobe Premiere, for example, and, and USB 3, you can basically do um, a lot of the same uh, quality video editing work that you used to only be able to do as a prosumer on Apple products. You can get the same hardware for a much cheaper price. Um, so there just isn't that same benefit of like, I can only really do this on Mac these days. So really it comes down to weighing the, the industrial design, user interface, um, and the fact that I'm now, you know, eight years plus um, comfortable with using Mac OS against um, the problems that I have with their um, restricted ecosystem, their short uh, release cycle, their breaking changes, no backward compatibility, and general opinionated approach to um, hardware and software development. As someone who is very like DIY, like I'm very, very into uh, building things from the ground up and really understanding like, how, how they work, why they work. The opinionated nature of, of Apple products is like very unattractive to me. They make a lot of like um, decisions where instead of uh, allowing many ways to do a single thing, they will choose the one way that you're supposed to do that thing. And if there was previously a different way of doing it, then that way will just no longer be available. That's why I like using other, other software other than stuff that Mac produces because I feel like at least you have a relationship that's not this kind of like monolith who's making all the decisions. I feel like the relationship between like the Mac, Mac, Mac products and the user is like, they act like we've invented this per you know, you kind of saw it with like the maps, maps catastrophe with the iPhone 5 where it's like, we've created this like perfect monolithic product. And like, if, if, it, if you can't use it correctly, then like that's like your bad, not any other way. Turn that into your own words. Well, the whole idea of the Macintosh was a computer for people who want to use a computer rather than learn how to use a computer. So, uh, the 
whole auditorium of about 2,500 people gave it a standing ovation. And uh, we were all just crying. Every, all of us were just... It was a very, very emotional moment. Because it was no longer ours. From that day forward, it was no longer ours. We couldn't change it. If we had a good idea the following day, it was too late. It, was, it belonged to the world at that point in time.